The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Welcome to Postcards. I'm Dana Johnson. From 1920 to 1933, prohibition had an effect on everyone, including those in the heartland of Minnesota. On today's episode, we'll take a look at Andrew Volstead and his impact on local history. It's a piece of history we have here in Granite Falls that doesn't exist anywhere else, anywhere else on the planet. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, really big thing. Andrew Volstead a congressman from Granite Falls, Minnesota, changed the landscape of the nation in the early part of the 20th century. A country overrun by saloons passed a law that tested the values of society and turned its citizens into criminals. If you look into the life of Andrew Volstead and the stories surrounding the law he enacted, you just might catch Volstead fever. Andrew Volstead bought this house in 1894. He lived in the house before he was elected to Congress and he came to visit on his when he wasn't in Washington, D.C. and stayed here. And in his later years, he also lived in the house next door here, but he still owned this house. Well, he was a member of the Judiciary Committee, and that, so they wrote a lot of the laws. And because he was a good law writer, he was the one to write the law. But a man named Wheeler was the one that was really the one that wanted to do the Prohibition Act. From what I understand, um, Volstead was uh, not really for Prohibition, not really against it. Um, he was head of the Judiciary Committee. And his name got put on the, on the uh, amendment. And uh, in true political form, uh, after he was defeated, soundly, uh, uh, from what I understand, in the very next election, after the, uh, the amendment was passed, he went to work for the, uh, the people in support of prohibition. They called them the dries. And uh, I guess he did that pretty much till the end of his career. I'm not sure about town members, but I know that he didn't like to talk about his association with the Volstead Act, this is after it was repealed, and refused to write any sort of biography, and I think he was rather upset of, about himself being portrayed as, you know, the bad guy and all this when he was just trying to write a law. Volstead alone was not to blame for prohibition. Anti-saloon leagues and temperance movements formed all over the state, including Granite Falls. Well, we know that there was a, a branch of the women's temperance movement here that was very active, and the town was dry at that time. The county was also dry, so there was, must have been a lot of support for the Prohibition Act. Though it would be Volstead who wrote the law that started Prohibition, he had hoped for more recognition on his other works in Congress. But he really was proud of the Capra-Volstead Act that 
that allowed farmers to form co-ops because he wasn't a farmer himself, but he owned farmland, so he knew, and living in a rural area, of course, he knew the importance of that. So that's what he wanted to be remembered for. The Capper Volstead Act is still in effect today, but the Volstead Act that turned prohibition into law remains his legacy. And given the strong German heritage in Minnesota, leaders here were reluctant to adopt prohibition. Because Minnesota had such a strong tradition of brewing and consuming beer, and obviously other alcoholic drinks as well, they did not go dry at an earlier date. And so Minnesota was not officially dry until national prohibition took effect in 1920. The breweries in Minnesota had a fair amount of warning that prohibition was on the way because for one thing, the neighboring state of North Dakota came into the Union as a dry state by its constitution. Most of the other states in the Union had gone dry in some way before the United States entered World War I, but it was the U.S. entry into World War I that really changed the picture for Minnesota's brewers. There were so many Germans that had moved here that they had really dominated the culture of many parts of the state. And when we went to war against the Germans, that created a real stress point in the communities. So anything that smacked of German tradition had to go. And of course, one of the most important things was the beer. So Minnesota was able to move into Prohibition somewhat more gradually. And a number of the smaller breweries, like Shell's, had had time to get their finances in order beforehand. My name is Ted Marty. I'm a fifth generation descendant of August Shell, and I am the president since 1986 of August Shell Brewing Company. Shell's Brewing Company in southern Minnesota is one of only a handful of breweries in the state to survive through prohibition. While some breweries switched production to things like dairy products, Shell's chose another route. One of the advantages that breweries had to staying open in Prohibition was that they had a lot of bottling equipment, they had cold storage facilities, and some of this was adaptable to other products. There were a number of breweries that went into the dairy business or some sort of ice cream products, as did the Keeble Brewery in Little Falls, Minnesota. Um, it was much easier, of course, to simply go with some sort of soft drink or other beverage which would use the bottling line just as it was. You've already got the tanks to mix things, and so that would work very well for a company such as Shell's. So August Shell chose to uh, produce non-alcoholic malt. So you had to get a special license from the federal government and obviously meet all the, the requirements of non-alcoholic malt, less than one-half of one percent alcohol. We made soft drinks uh, that we would have made and bottled and um, tried to manage surviving uh, through those years. So the situation was really different for a family-owned business like Shell's. In many cases, they were able to convert more easily over to some sort of alternate line of business, whereas a larger corporate brewery had so much capacity, they needed to have a major business to switch into if they were going to attempt to survive prohibition. Even by switching to different products, Shell's still struggled. We listed the brewery up in the Twin Cities, and um, uh, ironically, they would list it and then they would have a decent year, you know, or at least made some money and so then they would take it off and, and then they would list it again when things got a little tougher. And so the talk was, well, maybe we should just cash out and everybody go their separate ways. And so uh, luckily we didn't and uh, we made it through. We almost closed down during Prohibition because the uh, feds had come down and raided us and found some 
some of our non-alcoholic beer had too much alcohol in it and it was had more than one half of one percent and so we had to go up to the federal court in St. Paul and make a case why they shouldn't they were going to pull our license and I forget the amount of time they would but it would have been a would have been probably a fatal blow to us if we had lost the near non-alcoholic malt license and so we we pleaded our case that uh, business was so lousy and uh, the beer sat down in the cellar a little too long, fermented a little bit too much, and so um, the judge thought we did a, made a nice case and, and a nice presentation, and so they threw the charges out. So, so we survived the living of the day. Across the state, prohibition proved to be a breeding ground for illegal activity. Acts of bootlegging, speakeasies, and home brewing were not exclusive to America's largest cities. Prohibition hit this area in a different way. It, be, it made everybody home brewers. In fact, all the, uh, all the women were home brewers out here because uh, you could not do farm work without beer. That's just the way it was out here. And so. Um, you did farm work, at the end of the day, you had a beer. And whether that came from a brewery or whether that came from your kitchen, that's the way it was. And so out here, the, the, the women or the wives would make beer and leave it in the fridge, and then everybody would know where to go. And it was put your, put your, uh, put your money on top of the fridge, grab your beers. And we had breweries out here. They just were not licensed <laughs> or acknowledged publicly. <laughs> Some of the breweries continued to produce real beer anyway. The de-alcoholization process was the last step in the brewing process for near beer and it was possible to just skip that process and to accidentally have some kegs or cases of real beer go out to the public through carefully selected channels. But uh, my parents they had friends in Chicago on the other end of town, and uh, the two guys got together and made some homebrew. And when I was ready to bottle, they bottled it, and my dad and, and my mother uh, took a bag full along on the streetcar. Well, of course, the shaking of the streetcar and the warm temperature, the stuff started to pop the corks out. So they just abandoned their bag full of booze and uh, got off at the next stop. Uh, that was one thing that they, they chuckled about for many years after that. No, I know that my grandparents were made beer, and I think they even had a still at one time. It was just about everybody did that, you know. It was, well, everybody was poor, and that was a cheap way to get something to drink. Bootlegger's Supper Club in Granite Falls also has an illegal history behind it. The building was originally located in an area down the Minnesota River called Skunk Hollow, where it was a speakeasy, a place where alcohol was sold illegally. It was probably within the first two weeks, uh, the story sort of slowly started to surface. Do you know what was going on in your place, uh, you know, 70 years ago? Uh, and I said, no. So I was very happy to, to hear about that. When the federal agents would come into the county, everybody knew who they were because they drove the same cars. They drove yellow Packards. And not many other people in the area had yellow Packards. In fact, nobody did. And so when the yellow Packards came into town or into the county, um, everything would sort of go underground and shut down. And of course, that's the run and bootleg was what uh, started NASCAR racing with the fast cars because they had the fast cars to outrun the law. And then they started racing each other, and that's what developed in NASCAR racing today, what came from bootlegging. <laughs> I don't know if it had anything to really to do with them, but there is a way you can make a U-turn in the street, what they call the bootleggers uh, U-turn. You don't go around forward, you, where are you going? You back up and then you're ready on the way, uh, uh, you know, checking out. That's a faster way to, to uh, get, get away on a U-turn 
you know, if, if you saw somebody coming and you wanted to get out of there, you would make a bootlegger's U-turn. Nobody squealed because around here, these were, uh, you know, it's a German community and, and they all needed their, their uh, beer and, uh, and liquor, you know, just to, to uh, keep going. And so they wouldn't cut off their source of it. People were pretty creative in getting their alcohol. Doctors could prescribe it as a tonic for patients, which was pretty common around the weekends. People uh, uh, used to get their prescription and line up outside the drugstore on Friday afternoon, Friday evening. So it was a pretty busy place. Uh, a lot of people needed medication apparently to calm their nerves. And of course, others made their own alcohol. Stills for making moonshine or white lightning were often hidden in the woods or in barns, but they could still be discovered one way or another. The trick to making white lightning is it's not hard to get the alcohol, but to get the proof up, you have to have a stripper, which takes a lot of heat. And that was always the problem, and, it, and making the heat is what always told the tale of where the still was so they could find it. Al, you know, basically was at the brewery through Prohibition, and uh, the feds would come around all the time, you know. They, they would come either weekly or every other week to check because, you know, anybody that was making non-alcoholic malt had regular beer on, you know, so they had to check to make your, sure you had the right volume in your tanks so you weren't sending it out the door. And um, he had a li they had a little still, not a, it's, and it sits right behind me, uh, that the copper still there, it's what's left of it. Um, and he never, he was always worried that the feds would come and find that. One day he went down the basement and chopped it up. So, and, uh, but he didn't throw it out, so we still have the remnants of it here. For 13 years, Minnesota and the nation were under the strict rules of prohibition. When President Roosevelt was elected in 1932, Congress adjusted the Volstead Act to say that beer and wine, that is 3.2% alcohol by weight, is non-intoxicating, giving a start to the repeal of Prohibition by 1933. Right before Prohibition, there were about 60 breweries operating in the state. And within a couple years after Prohibition was repealed in 1933, about two dozen breweries opened up again. Well, you, you have to remember, one of the advantages of making non-alcoholic malt was you always had beer in the cellars, and, and literally full-strength beer. Um, because the way we made non-alcoholic malt was we, we would, you know, we brew the wort in the brew house, ferment it to beer, and then pump it back into the kettle and then boil off the alcohol. So we always had beer in the cellar. And so um, for those that didn't know when exactly prohibition would end, you know, they almost had to wait until, you know, they got confirmation that it was going to end. And then they could start brewing. Well, all the brewers that were making non-alcoholic malt, they had beer ready to bottle and out the door it went. So on April 7, 1933, the Shell Brewery and nine others throughout the state and about 50 throughout the country celebrated New Beer's Day by releasing beer at 12.01 in the morning to people who were camped outside the gates and waiting at taverns throughout the upper Midwest. Well, the only thing is uh, Warren, my father, would say, talk about the the whole parking lot out there being just jammed at midnight, you know, because you couldn't start shipping till one minute after, you know, midnight. And so the, they would have an agent at every brewery, you know, to make sure that no beer went out early. And so, so it was a, a quite the party, I guess. The actual repeal of the 18th Amendment did not come around until December when the final necessary 36th state, which was, believe it or not, Utah, ratified the 21st Amendment, which repealed the 18th. 
The repeal of prohibition also allowed for the opening of bars across the country. In the town of Ghent, in the southwest corner of Minnesota, the Silver Dollar Bar was known for getting the first liquor license in Minnesota in 1934. So the, uh, the bar was in the original building two doors down, and then in 1986 this building was purchased, and uh, the bar was moved in pieces, uh, very large pieces, from that building into this building. So Red Angles was the original owner of the bar and uh, he was the one that obtained the first license. Um, I don't know what the exact history is behind why Red Engels decided he needed to be the first man there, but uh, there is a story and an article in the, in the newspaper uh, clipping that we have that says that uh, they left to go to the Twin Cities to try and be the first one there. Um, actually had a car accident on the way and then still managed to make it there and get the first liquor license for the state of Minnesota. Ghent is described as the international roly bowly capital, a Belgian sport like horseshoes mixed with bowling. The courts by the silver dollar are a popular attraction. Though the silver dollar bar has recently closed, the owners are grateful for the history they shared with it. It's always been a nice bar to work with and and it's everybody has given us compliments on the on the looks of it. They said because there aren't that many old bars that look like this one does. And meet a lot of new people from all over the country that stop in because being it's the first licensed bar in the state of Minnesota, we have a lot of travelers going through it like to stop and look at it and see what they know. And so all these little bits of history are, are slipping away on us and we kind of want to try and keep up on it. But, uh, you know, the people that live here know. The people that move here learn. Like I say, we've had a lot of nice people and people have really been good to us and we've tried to return the generosity to them too. Prohibition's history in Minnesota has long since ended, but brewing remains as strong as ever. In many ways, I think the future of the brewing industry in Minnesota is going to look a lot more like the pre-prohibition landscape. We've got a few larger firms, such as Shells and Summit, which are going to dominate the landscape. But more and more people are moving into starting breweries because it's something that they enjoy doing. It's a skill that they already have. And what we've seen in the last several years is a number of home brewers essentially going pro. And the small two to four person business is very typical of the type of breweries that were all through the Minnesota countryside prior to Prohibition. Lucan, Minnesota is home to Brow Brothers Brewing Company, which started as a brew house attached to a restaurant. As demand grew for more beer, so did their operation. Though not as large as companies like Shell's, they still provide customers with a great product. As far as our small size, our biggest advantage is, is flexibility and the ability to be dynamic. And we're big believers in vertical integration. We grow our own hops, we grow our own barley, we do all our own graphic design. Uh, we do our best to, lo to, to, to source as much as we can locally. Um, a lot of our niche ingredients, we can do that. Um, we do as much as we can here, partially because you kind of have to be self-sufficient out in such a small area, but then partially because we can make changes quickly. We can add or subtract beers to our lineup really easily. And so uh, in terms of scale, that's one of the few advantages to being a small brewery. And sometimes you have to remind yourself that it's, you know, it's fun when you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're, you know, you get your face covered in, in malt dust and, uh, um, you know, you break something, which we do almost daily here. You do have to remind yourself that this is, you're still making beer. And it's, it's the same process. It's the same thing that we did as home brewers years ago. We're just doing it on a larger scale. It may be easy to think that the law was a poor mark on American history. 
while the great American experiment that was prohibition failed, it did help bring the nation where it is today. And this event can all be traced back to one simple Minnesota man, Andrew Volstead. He wasn't a teetotaler, but he didn't mind other people drinking. But he went, as long as the law was in effect, of course, he would stick to that. But he just wanted to make sure that, the, you know, he was a lawyer and wanted to make sure the law was enforced. That's all for now. For more information, go to our website. Join us again next week on Postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota, shalomhillfarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Uh -huh.